this short overview introduces one uh, of several potential responses to the, to the not so distant threat of major population displacement precipitated by clim climate change. It'll show how policies and programs for carefully managed retreat might advance other societal objectives simultaneously. So to do that, I'm gonna try to connect the dots between two trends uh, that give rise to one action plan. So first, obviously the ongoing failure to curtail greenhouse gas emissions points us towards unavoidable climate disruption. Uh, second, the demographic phenomenon of rural to urban migration is, is not new, uh, very much persistent, and has caused marginalization and devitalization of rural areas worldwide and creating the sharp uh, urban-rural economic divide. Many regions are undermined by drought, uh, deforestation, industrialization of agriculture, uh, with extreme weather and other stresses helping to empty out rural regions, as many seek employment that's concentrated in really urban centers. So um, this exodus contributes to a relentlessly urbanizing planet and particularly producing what might be uh, termed hyper-urbanized areas, uh, densely crowded cities and vulnerable informal settlements. So, I'm going to suggest that combined, both trends uh, middle to late this century may ultimately render unsustainable uh, many inland and coastal metropolitan areas, uh, jeopardizing especially the low density sprawl in, in deltas and river plains in both industrial and emerging economies, and setting in motion unprecedented population displacement. So. Um, some say, even if we manage to curtail global warming at two degrees Celsius, uh, studies indicate that unchecked climate destabilization may, in fact, profoundly remap human settlement patterns. Um, some recent estimates uh, are shown here. 800 million from more than 570 coastal cities are at levels of risk by 2050 from sea level rise. Then there's the 20 to 30 percent of the world's land surface that faces desertification, causing potential relocation of a total of more than 140 million people across sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and Latin America. Um, some say that this could result in a displacement of an average of one person out of 45 worldwide as well. So, uh, where will these displaced millions find accommodation? Internal climate migration certainly will be one ine inevitable reality. Um, but I suggest it need not become a crisis if targeted um, action is taken now to better predict and prepare um, by time, not waiting until 2050 when levels of chaos from, from displaced multitudes may begin to become unmanageable. Uh, managed retreat will involve a range of approaches, and here I'll speak about just one, but submit that this could address several problems at once. Um, so most of you know managed retreat is conventionally uh, deemed the last of three climate change adaptation options after protection um, and accommodation. Uh, it is essentially restructuring development in climate safer locales to replace at-risk settlements. Um, and it can mean deliberate resettlement of whole communities, uh, which is kind of what I am uh, looking at. Essentially, it involves spatial planning scenarios that can and probably will likely take many forms uh, to successfully blend the displaced with receiving communities and at the same time provisioning necessary services. Um, however, the prospect of planned population resettlement at, at the, the scale I've just described really leaves us in uncharted waters. So uh, one scenario I'm gonna explore here is the preparation of climate safe hinterland areas, if you will, and, and particularly their small cities and towns uh, to receive retreating populations. 
at face value, this is um, a pretty bold uh, proposition, but I will argue one with development co-benefits. So for example, it will prevent the influx of the displaced into cities and megacities already overwhelmed uh, or overburdened. Um, it could create more equitable distribution into the receiving regions of society's investments in jobs, uh, service industries, and particularly food production. And it will ultimately result in the creation of more resilient and self-sustaining local economies, as I will argue. We should also note that as COVID uh, has revealed to us, people in the industrialized world have already retreated from cities to lower density areas, enabled by teleworking, and many permanently. So one could speculate that a more equitable and local way of relatively rural life in small towns and small cities can help reduce both the inequities and the cultural dissonances found in today's urban and rural divide. So um, with the slow onset effects of climate change, it could be said that there is sufficient time for preparation to occur in receiving areas. In the next decades, investments could address rural decline and climate migration both by working towards regenerating the hinterland to accommodate the displaced, uh, as well as keep the existing population in that locale. So these designated climate safer regions could arguably feature what we could foresee as networks of compact small towns and cities if planned and developed by future proofing these existing settlements. So a modest redevelopment creating ecologically sensitive decarbonized new habitations, infrastructure, and a more closed loop economy, as I will show here, thereby mitigating uh, greenhouse gas emissions while uh, also adapting to climate change. Um, if approached from a circularity or circular economy framework, which is diagrammed here, just one such uh, hypothetical uh, organization, um, and modeled on nature's metabolic flows, uh, waste from one sector or activity passes as beneficial input to another. So the framework in particular um, intends to optimize synergies, especially across not only the infrastructural sectors and commercial enterprises, as I show here, but also importantly, incorporating regenerative approaches to local agriculture, and forestry under the rubric of a more bio-based economy. And I think it's important to add and remind you all, we have all of the readily available off the shelf technical capabilities to do this. It's, it's a question of how we can optimize by reconfiguring the connections. So arguments in support of this process, well, I, start with first since uh, 2014, when the European Commission adopted the Circular Economy Action Planning, it has detailed um, more than 50 discrete actions to accelerate its implementation. So this is not new. Second, as stated, developing an ultra low uh, carbon economy would radically, could radically reduce, should radically reduce these populations ecological footprint, no mean feat. Um, and better preparing us for the Anthropocene. Circularized economies modeled at this much more manageable scale can inspire replication at the more challenging urban scale. And lastly, it's important to add that in developing nations, a scaled up transition to the circular model could simultaneously advance a majority of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So the question we pose and address tomorrow in our discussions have much to do with how such a process might be carried out, what is the leadership involved, um, and what are the barriers to that. But let me start with the notion of uh, the governance. To that end, I think, 
we should anticipate the need for multi-level modes of governance uh, to achieve a successful implementation. And first, the, the, an overarching authority, be it an international entity or a, particularly a state body that can uh, envision, incentivize and manage realignment of vulnerable populations. And to do that, it has to be capable of creating a national discourse on the imperatives of planned relocation and identifying appropriate regions uh, while discouraging development in vulnerable regions. And that has to be done really at a state level. Establishing new institutional structures and domestic laws to first prepare receiving townships and subsequently to operationalize resettlement. To do this, I think it needs to provide detailed roadmaps and best practices. And, and those currently don't exist ex except in fragments and have, of course, never been tested at this scale. National strategies, though, have to be complemented by a much more forward-thinking and nimble uh, regional or local government. They need to undertake the infrastructural realignments, rebuild a bioeconomy. They have to be capable, in particular, of power sharing across what, what needs to be cooperative and inclusive networks of uh, public, private, and civic stakeholders. So even as public awareness grows of impending climate chaos, there are multiple impediments to undertaking strategic re retreat at scale, not the least of which, of course, is a natural fear of preemptive managed retreat as a kind of social engineering. But for discussion tomorrow, we know that internal managed retreat will certainly entail significant national costs uh, that include buyout of or compensation for lost private assets and fiscal incentives to relocate, though this may be less costly than ignoring the problem. Um, also, given our bias towards short-term political thinking, governmental management capacity for long-term planning for strategic retreat is lacking at all levels and across all sectors. And I think holistic approaches such as the one I've tried to describe are rare and challenging indeed. In receiving communities, there's a built-in uh, business as usual inertia. We can assume that unless integrally involved, uh, receiving communities may resent and oppose an influx of outsider population. So whereas today adaptation is the entrenched model in public discourse and politicians may perceive retreat as defeat. Uh, so managed retreat must overcome this bias. So the transitions ahead of us in the coming decades are really unprecedented and the humanitarian community is totally unprepared to deal with major climate triggered displacement um, and some of the chaos it will bring. So at the same time, there's an unmet need to undertake a redevelopment and particularly a re revitalization of essential rural regions that have all too long been in decline for a number of reasons. Combining these issues allows us to contemplate one solution serving both ends. So I hope I've shown how anticipatory uh, managed retreat can provide positive opportunities in comparison to say reactive actions. And we know that a post pandemic world with high unemployment and a current discount rate hovering close to zero makes this an ideal time to explore this transition. So thank you. Well, so I thank Hillary again and said that she did very, that you did very well in time and in content. And I have a number of questions for you that we Great. can. Uh, yeah. the, the first one is from Francis Voorhees. Can the hinterland be both resettled and rewilded? I, yes, exactly the point. I think the answer is it has to be um, at simultaneously. And, and part of the initiative of bringing people to these areas um, is to help use their labor to regenerate regions, to do uh, agroforestry, restoration, permaculture, all of the things we know uh, will re rebuild soils um, and restore carbon in our forests as well. So yes, 
I, I see this as in part a labor force using advanced technology to do just that specific thing. All right. Then the, the, the other side of the question is what kind of capacity building effort will be required <laughs> to create a critical mass of skilled people <laughs> yeah. and institutional uh, institutions capable of doing all this? Yeah, well, that's, that's the million dollar question. And as I say, I think that there is lack of capacity uh, for horizontal thinking that is needed across sectors. You know, in order to create a critical mass of skilled people, uh, we have to start with teaching systems thinking, which is currently not stressed in the, in the sciences or the humanities for that matter. And so, yeah, I think, we, you know, it's, it's, I endeavor to teach some of these things in, in to my uh, small group of students, but we really need to enable them to think in a much more holistic manner and to give them the skills. And, you know, they're, they're anxious. They're anxious to do uh, agriculture, urban agriculture, uh, things like um, controlled agriculture, even in rural settings. Uh, can employ people and make a huge difference. Okay, and then the last question is from Colleen. She thanks you for a very interesting talk and then asks, to what extent does this work link to, if at all, all the Kate Rayworth donut economy approach? Ah, yeah, I think the donut economy approach, the, the circular economy, if that's what you're referring to, uh, is, is central to being able to operationalize this. We can't, the imperative for us is to devise solutions that solve multiple problems, food, water, energy, simultaneously. We can't do them one at a time. I, I can't stress that enough. So if that's what's meant by the donut economy approach. Um, um, so maybe just quickly to jump in and others can maybe, um, essentially it's a very nice heuristic that she's using worldwide that shows the kind of outer threshold or limits to our kind of biophysical world, right. um, thresholds, right. the tipping points, and then the, the social, which is the floor, if you like, of the, the, or the inner ring of the donut, which are the social um, barriers or constraints. And then essentially what happens is that you've just got this nice juicy donut that we've got to keep <laughs> and hopefully not transgress these boundaries. So I think it does link into the circular economy approach, but it's getting huge traction um, and I think even um, Amsterdam and their city council have, yes. have adopted this. So I just wondered if there were some linkages because there seems there might be some interesting leverages here or links. Yeah, I, I absolutely think so. And you have to sort of juxtapose. I've seen, I've seen that diagram, of course. And, and you have to juxtapose that, I think, uh, with the formulation of, of a small scale model. You have to look at the socioeconomic and, and political factors, um, which are highly intertwined um, and which will permit us not to exceed those, those boundaries, but to regenerate from within. 